Thank you, General President Schaeberger and the entire IFF staff for allowing me the opportunity to provide some opening remarks and background regarding our experience with the Waldo Canyon fire. Uh, I'm going to try to be brief. It's a long story, and Alex is going to attest to that. There's a tremendous amount of data and information out there, but I just want to touch kind of on the brief uh, piece of my experience out there before we let Alex really get into the data there. Before I begin, I do want to recognize the hundreds of local five members that answered the call during the Waldo Canyon fire. Several of our members returned from vacation when they learned that the fire had burned into the city. This demonstrates their unbelievable dedication to the community they've sworn to protect. Even as we speak, dozens of local five members are deployed across the Pacific Northwest, assisting with the devastating wildfires in the region. In addition, I want to extend our appreciation to the countless IFF members that responded from across the state and country. As we've learned, incidents of this magnitude require collaboration that stretches far beyond jurisdictions. Some quick background on myself. I represent your average Colorado Springs firefighter. While I've always maintained my basic wildland certifications and training, I've never deployed outside of the city or been a member of our specialized wildland team. Prior to the Waldo Canyon fire, my experience consisted of the incidents that we respond to in our city every day. I didn't serve in any command function during the Waldo Canyon fire. I'm simply a backseat firefighter. But as Lori mentioned, I was assigned to one of the first arriving engine companies the night we lost two citizens and nearly 350 homes right in our city. As I reflect back on the incident, I recalled two distinct themes. First, several members of my immediate family live in the immediate burn area and they were evacuated on an emergent basis. So without question, the incident hit close to home. We all felt a significant urgency to respond and make a difference knowing that our families and their homes were in immediate danger. On the other hand, this is what we all refer to in this room as a career fire, right? This is, this is kind of what we signed up for. We knew there was going to be a ton of work that night, and while we certainly don't want tragedy to strike, we want to be there and we want to be the one to, to respond to that stuff if it, if it does go down. So that night we were at the same time as, as urgent as the response was, we were excited to get out there and get to work and be able to make a difference there. For all of that considered, it was an experience that many, if not all of us, had never dealt with prior to this incident. We fight our share of small grass fires and brush fires, fires that are typically extinguished in an hour or so. But we never had a dealt with a fire that had threatened tens of thousands of homes and residents of our very own community. The day of the burnover, I was fortunate enough to have accepted an overtime shift with one of my longtime members, our mentors on the job. That day, he was assigned as my company officer. And like me, his wildland experience consisted of the routine or smaller scale incidents that we normally handle within our city. While his wildland experience may have been limited, his leadership skills were among the best of the business, and they still are today. That proved key throughout that night and into the next day. His intuition as a firefighter and leader, along with many other capable men and women that night, allowed them to adjust to a very dynamic and complex event in order to make a direct impact in the neighborhoods when we operated. As Alex will demonstrate with measurable data, Responding to an event of this magnitude cannot be planned out while the incident's unfolding. While decision makers were working through the necessary logistical challenges, homes were actively being lost. One of the most important lessons we've learned is that these types of incidents are more a matter of when rather than if. With that knowledge, we now know that we have to plan accordingly. We must anticipate future wildland events that will quickly overwhelm local resources. In talking with Alex, their findings very much illustrate what we experienced on the ground. The initial fire attack, once it enters into urban neighborhoods, is effectively handled in a similar fashion to the way we attack typical building fires. Initial attack companies must be able to operate within pre-established guidelines and expectations. The reflex time is greatly reduced and our ability to stop the loss of life and property on the front lines is significantly enhanced when the crews have predetermined tasks and functions to perform. Simply put, we don't have time to figure it out once we get there. The incident provided a very narrow window of opportunity to prevent an even greater loss of life and property. And while freelancing obviously has to be avoided, crews are most effective when they're allowed to use their judgment to make critical decisions in real time on the ground. As Alex will discuss, the most successful stops took place during the firestorm when companies took direct action against burning structures. To say this event was a learning experience for us is a massive understatement. The results of the study, along with the internal reviews of the incident, continue to provide us with lessons on how we can do better. 
As residential and commercial growth into the wildland urban interface expands, these types of fires are becoming more and more common. For this reason, we must continue to explore methods for increasing our effectiveness in responding to these incidents. On behalf of Local 5, I want to thank Alex and NIST for partnering with the IAFF to pursue a path that enhances the capability of our fire department and fire departments across North America. The representatives from NIST participated in what I can only imagine was a painstaking process of interviewing nearly every member of the Colorado Springs Fire Department that responded to the event. They grabbed data from every source available in order to put together a timeline that explains exactly what happened, down to the minute. Every detail was analyzed specific to the individual company operating at specific addresses. It seems in talking with Alex that he knows more about what I did and what my company did that night than I remember doing. So. This approach is a huge undertaking, but it assures that we'll utilize every opportunity to learn from the incident. So for a much sharper and more scientific analysis of the Waldo Canyon Fire, I'm pleased to announce Alex from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Thank you, thank you Jeremy, and uh, thank you all for uh, having us here to uh, share with you some of our findings from uh, our Waldo fire investigation. Before we get into the Waldo, I want to take a couple of minutes and um, uh, put the incident in perspective and really share with you that uh, we believe that the uh, fire landscape in the U.S. is really changing. Uh, the problem is not the same uh, going back to the 70s. Looking at America burning and looking at what we have today, uh, we are seeing a completely different problem emerging. Uh, some statistics are on the uh, overhead projectors. Going back 30, 40, even 50 years, we're losing maybe 100, 200 structures in the wild and urban interface. Uh, while the numbers are fuzzy right now and incomplete, we know that we're probably in the three to 5,000 structures per year and climbing very rapidly. So uh, we're gonna need a paradigm shift because as you're gonna see through this uh, presentation here, this is a different animal. This is not a structure fire and this is not a wildland type of fire. The presence of the wui, uh, no matter how you define it, there are over half a dozen different uh, definitions, uh, can be found all over the U.S., but for the most part, a uh, very large number of the structures are here in the uh, East Coast, uh, from uh, Boston all the way down to Atlanta. You can see it um, in um, yellow and red on the map. However, that's not the whole story. What we're interested in is not only where there is vegetation and structures, which is what defines the WUI, but also where the moisture in the vegetative fuel and the topography and the local weather cause the problems. And this tells us a completely different story. Um, the problem is primarily in the West. You can all see in the news what's going on from California all the way through Canada, all the way up to Alaska. Uh, and uh, this is not going to go away anytime soon, unfortunately. So what type of problem are we dealing with? This is not a homeowner problem. I want to stress this because uh, over the last um, 15 to 20 years, uh, due to the lack of science, we have uh, chosen this path where we have, in many cases, felt that the homeowner can really um, take the largest share of this uh, burden. And unfortunately, this is not the case. It'd be similar to saying we as um, users of this uh, facility are responsible for building the sprinkler system before we occupy the room. That doesn't make any sense. We have to think of this in a completely different way. Uh, this is an engineering problem, and this is a first responder problem. Uh, and together, we can really address it. Uh, homeowners will need to be educated. The public will need to be educated, absolutely. There are a lot of uh, components to this very multi-jurisdictional challenge. But it is an engineering problem through codes and standards and building improvements and a fire response problem. So. Uh, the wildland urban interface type of fires is really one of the last disasters that until recently did not have a yardstick and exposure scale associated with it. Uh, we have um, tornado scales, we have 
hurricane scales, we have earthquake scales uh, to judge the severity of the, of the disaster, but until recently we did not have a Wallen Urban Interface uh, scale. Uh, what did this translate to? Well, every disaster you went to was the worst disaster. So you went to the witch fire, you spoke with the instant commander, that was the worst fire. You went to the Waldo fire, that was the worst fire. You went to the uh, Ponderosa fire, that was the worst fire. And that by no means um, shows a discontinuity in the knowledge. It's just that it's very hard to judge without having a, a tool that you can use. And uh, the exposure skill that we're proposing uh, will let us capture through science and be able to uh, articulate how we can improve building codes and help us with the response of our first, with the first responders and, and how to handle this in the field. A uh, little bit of background how we got to the wild. We have done three of these uh, case studies starting with uh, 2007 uh, going down uh, to the witch fire, the witch Gehita fire in uh, California. We're invited by Cal Fire uh, while we're downtown here in DC on a blue ribbon uh, panel for the WUI. All three case studies have been done with our uh, first responder partners uh, in situ. We cannot do this work without you guys. It's absolutely essential that, that we partner with you and, and do this work. For the witch fire, we did it with uh, uh, Cal Fire and San Diego Fire Department. Uh, and when I mention which is really just one small community, the trails community in Rancho Bernardo, that was affected by both the witch and the Gehita fires. Uh, the witch fire was almost 200,000 acres with over 10,000 homes within the fire perimeter and we could not study the whole thing. But it helped us really start laying a framework for how to even collect data on that scale because this, this had never been done in the past. So the first report uh, helped us really pull together a timeline reconstruction which we identified as essential and we got a teaser. We dove into the defensive actions and uh, made the hypothesis that these are really, really important in the field. Uh, and as you'll see through the presentation, uh, they're not just important, they're elemental, they're essential to understanding what's going on in the WUI. Uh, in trying to understand why certain homes uh, were saved or were left standing and other homes were not, uh, we looked at the data for the better part of a year and at the end of about 11 months, we realized we need that yardstick. We need that exposure scale. Otherwise, you cannot analyze the data. Uh, and uh, we articulated the framework of the exposure scale, the WE exposure scale, and went back and analyzed the data, and things made, made a lot of sense. Uh, in uh, 2010, 2011, we forward deployed to Texas. Uh, we trained with our partners in Texas Forest Service, moved our equipment there. And when the uh, 2011 fires broke in Amarillo, we had boots on the ground collecting data about 44 hours after ignition. Uh, so we wanted to capture the data before the homeowners were allowed back in the, in the community to capture the data as pristine, in an as pristine fashion as possible. And uh, our last case study is the Waldo, and that's really what I wanna uh, talk about here. Uh, this was done with uh, uh, our partnership with the Colorado Springs Fire Department and because we looked at the entire fire, as was the case in Amarillo, but only on a much larger scale here at the Waldo, uh, we tracked down all the mutual aid. Uh, and when I say track down all the mutual aid, we went all the way to Northern California to talk with the Forest Service folks. We went to Oregon to talk with the Forest Service folks. Uh, we tracked down personnel that had moved. Uh, in total, we spoke with over 220 first responders uh, to give you a scale of the level of effort Four and a half thousand hours were invested in just collecting the data, and we have probably close to 2,000 hours in the data analysis and the quality control. The quality control is another way of saying we're checking the data. So uh, we had, through our partnership with all the mutual aid, the ability to really cross-correlate and cross-reference and that really made for a really one-of-a-kind unique data set where now we can look at what Jeremy did and we can cross-correlate it with pictures, AVL, uh, GPS, radio logs, and other first responders. And it all ties together. So what, you, what I'm going to show you here is uh, not a drive-by study. This is many, many years of uh, work and 
a very unique understanding, we believe, of what's going on uh, at the wildland urban interface in that type of fire. So on uh, the right side of the screen is our team, uh, all of our science collaborators, and all the small print are all the mutual aid uh, that uh, participated in this uh, undertaking. Uh, 115 rigs, if I remember correctly, to track the 101 that were in the fire. And we tracked from when the fire hit the community uh, nominally for the first 12 hours. We didn't uh, go into the mop-up phase. So uh, what happened uh, really at the Waldo? What, what is the Waldo all about? Uh, first, I want to acknowledge all, all of our uh, technical partners. And, uh, you can see the alphabet soup up, up on top there, but we couldn't have done it without all, all, all of these collaborations. Uh, 344 homes were destroyed, 101 structures were identified as uh, damaged, and that is both confirmed and unconfirmed. About 750 homes were within the fire perimeter of, of interest in, in our study domain, and uh, we have over 4,500 discrete observations in time and space, uh, including defensive actions. So when cross-correlated with the thousands of pictures, that really gives us a pretty unique snapshot of what happened. And looking at the broader picture, what really happened at the Waldo, uh, fire started in the wildlands, moved towards Colorado Springs, and over time hit three communities. Uh, the lower part on the south, Cedar Heights just got a glance. Not a single structure was affected. Not a single structure actually experienced any embers, assault. In the middle, Mountain Shadows, that's where all the structures were destroyed. We're going to focus most of the um, next 10, 15 minutes on that. And then to the north, there's a very, very interesting um, case study in the Peregrine community. Not a single structure was destroyed, and the damage was very limited. So the fire arrived from the wildlands. But what is very interesting, once you pull that timeline together, you realize that only about a fifth of the homes were actually ignited from the wildland event. So another way to say this is four-fifths of the homes were ignited from other homes and other fuels inside the wildland urban interface. That changes how we, we have to start thinking about um, these types of incidents. So structure to structure is very, very important, and once once more, what we really saw, which is the hypothesis we had set forth all the way back, uh, the witch fire, is that the exposure, and when we talk about exposure, we really talk about both fires, fire, flame, and ember, firebrands. Uh, those exposures really change on a scale that is very, very small. Now, people think of the wildland fire as a very large, almost cataclysmic event, and that is definitely the case in many cases when it comes and hits a community, and we'll, we'll see some of that in a second. But at a parcel level, there can be very significant dis differences from one side of a quarter acre parcel to the other side. And it's at that type of resolution that you really have to study the event in order to make sense of what is going on. Because if you look at it from 30,000 feet, then it, it, it all looks very, very um, homogeneous. So, in these two figures, we tell the whole story of the defensive actions. On the left, uh, I apologize for the fine print, there are 154 parcels where the structures were defended successfully by Jeremy and his team members without any indication of structure ignition. That is a very, very important statement. To put it in perspective, there were 345 homes lost. So half as many were safely saved, but without any indication of damage. Now, if you don't understand that, you look at this incident, and the perspective you get is completely different. On the right, all the parcels that are color-coded green over 250 of them are parcels where we have confirmed defensive actions at a parcel level. 
And we know we don't have all the parcel defensive action information because the first responders told us there was so much vegetative activity that they couldn't keep track of every single parcel that they defended. However, when you put those two pieces of information together, what really comes out of this is that you cannot interpret the fire scene in a post wui fire environment unless you understand the defensive actions. Because what we're seeing in the Waldo, when you drive by and look at the aftermath of one of those wui events, is the connection between the fire and the defensive actions. And that is a game changer. That is a game changer because, as you're going to see here in the next couple of slides, now we can start quantifying how well the defensive actions work for the first time. And from a hazard mitigation perspective, equally importantly, we cannot go and assess a community without understanding what the first responders did. So you cannot just drive by and look at a house and say, this was stuck or that's why it was saved. You cannot do that anymore. We have the data here to show it. So let's look now at some specifics uh, that uh, are really quite amazing. Uh, we talked about 154 undamaged and defended structures, uh, which is really half uh, of the total number of destroyed, just to put it in perspective. That's a very, very large number. And no one, uh, I believe, expected uh, that number to be so large uh, in the Waldo. And it's a testament to all the unbelievable work that was done by the first responders. Next, I want to point out that um, out of the 101 structures that um, we know were damaged, uh, we were able to identify on 94 of them, so 93%, who actually stopped the fire. And uh, that is very important for two reasons. It enables us to identify vulnerabilities, but also the corollary of this is there aren't too many structures that self-extinguish. And that is very, very important because in many cases, the defensive action information can be so slick and so efficient and almost transparent that unless you go through the process, this very extensive process of collecting the data, you can miss it. So there can be a scenario where you have a deck that caught on fire, you have part of the deck that is blackened, and nothing else is showing because Jeremy or another person of his team went around the back, took a garden hose, put the deck out, moved the garden hose, and there's no evidence. So all this type of information really helps us understand what are the true vulnerabilities in the community, and that's how we can improve them through um, uh, improving building codes and standards. And now two more statistics that I want to share with you. 75% of attempts to extinguish structures on fire were successful. Uh, and that's the first time we have that type of number on that scale. And 80%, 79% of the time, containment of a structure to prevent the fire from spreading to adjacent structures uh, was, was successful. These are extremely efficient and effective responses. Um, by the first responders, both from Colorado Springs and mutual aid. This is really uh, a game changer in terms of looking at the scene and what it really means, what really happened. So uh, just to give you one, uh, one small piece of, our, of the uh, data here, the report is in review and will be coming out the next couple of months. Um, this shows the area of Courtney where significant losses, structural losses occurred from structure to structure and the very effective boxing in uh, that took place. Uh, and this type of boxing in of containing the fire at a much larger scale uh, was very effective and was identified throughout the uh, Waldo fire. Now, I want to talk about uh, containments a little bit because now we have the data, we have the resolution to actually understand those, I'm not going to call them failures, uh, those cases where containment was not successful. And now we can ask the question why it was not successful. And if you look at the data, nine in the middle of the figure on the right and three higher up, so 12 total, were in very high density built environments. So uh, to give you a sense of how high density we're talking about, 
right next to the nine. Uh, structures had um, structure separation distances of as little as six feet. That's the distance between my fingertips. Uh, so in that type of housing density, it's quite understandable why the containment was so difficult to achieve, even when resources were available, just physically very difficult to stop that energy from transferring from one structure to another. So what this has led uh, us to think is that we really need a paradigm shift for these very, very high density areas. You know, in the past, uh, people have been thinking about the WUI as um, a way to um, have a community in an environment that can handle fire, so make a community uh, able to absorb a fire assault. Well, what we're seeing in this, those high density areas, we just cannot afford the fire to get in there because once it gets in there, it is essentially impossible to stop. So we need a paradigm shift. Uh, those are areas uh, where we should be thinking about creating buffers around them, uh, fuel discontinuities, and these types of discontinuities, um, whether you're doing it through a fuel treatment or through a golf course or through other uh, vehicles, can enable first responders to either stay there, so not evacuate, uh, when the wildland fire approaches, or enable them to, to return much quicker and be more effective in engaging the fire before it gets deep-seated and, and out of control. So we talked that the exposure really changes on a sub-parcel level. This is a, a picture of the uh, water tower and the fire came from the left, from the uh, west, and moved to the community to the right. Uh, that water tower was sufficient to create a lee, a shelter behind it. The homes to the left and the right of that water tower were destroyed, and the home right behind it was saved. Uh, it gives you a sense of the scale of, of the exposure variation uh, in that community. So what we have seen is that uh, resources are absolutely critical. Getting those resources to the scene are important. You're gonna, we're gonna talk about that in one sec. But what we're also seeing is that low exposure defensive actions should not be discarded. They can be very, very, very efficient. Through our 220 plus discussions, we identified a large number of structure ignitions that were stopped with garden hoses, low flow, water, hand tools. And these changed the landscape. This changed how many homes were actually destroyed. And, and that's a significant lesson uh, to, uh, to take out of uh, this. So uh, here we have uh, the data showing uh, what tools were used to protect those 154 homes. And while the largest contributor are fire hoses, we see that hand tools and uh, garden hoses are almost as important when combined as the, as the uh, uh, fire hoses. So I wanna now talk a little bit about how the entire instant response worked. And Jeremy mentioned a little bit about that, but I really wanna dive in uh, in the next uh, 10 minutes and, uh, and provide a potential paradigm shift here. So I'm not, talking, I'm not gonna talk about a siege. I'm not gonna talk about um, a scenario like 2007 in California um, where there are no resources available. That's, that's not what we're after here. What, what I wanna talk about is how to actually deploy um, current resources, and this is given the information from this study. So um, let's look at it. The WUI has really been an orphan. The, the, the WUI has been an orphan uh, jurisdictionally because we have people that own the uh, land, whether it is federal, state, or local jurisdictions, and people that own the structures, and this interface has, has been neglected from code, standards, best practices, and response. And here, on the left, I have put how a building fire develops. On the right, I have um, 
uh, put down how a wildland fire develops, and in the middle we have the buoy. And if you look at it, you see that it's not a structural type of environment, and it's not a wildland type of environment. The challenge is that we don't have really the protocols in place right now to help us respond in an effective way. So in a nutshell, in urban fires, seconds count. That's why we're talking about responding in minutes. In Wui fires, minutes count. Uh, and I'll give you a, a quick statistic here. Uh, when we're almost done with the data collection process, I, uh, I spoke with the um, chief of Colorado Springs, Chief Riley, and um, I gave him a little handout, and it had a little box, and it had three numbers, 350 homes destroyed, 346. 300 or so were destroyed in the first four to six hours. That meant one structure a minute. So I told him, I said, when everybody was getting together at ICP, spreading the maps on the hood of the suburban and starting to figure out how we're going to lay out the divisions, I said, in the background, we're losing one house a minute. And it's actually more than that, because for every home we lose on the front end, we lose three, four, maybe five homes on the tail end, because homes make other homes burn and so on and so forth. So we need to change how we are responding here. So uh, this is from all the data that we collected. The fire hit the community at 1724, to give you a sense of our resolution, plus or minus two minutes. And then it spread into the community. And yes, it was cataclysmic. Yes, it was very, very um, scary. Uh, embers the size of fists flying through the community. Uh, wind severe to the point where it was ripping uh, doors off uh, vehicles visibility down to a few feet. But now I want to show you what that place looked like exactly one hour after. So this is one of the first engines coming in to scout. And you can see on the uh, upper part of the screen, blue sky. There is some wind, but not a lot of wind. So there are a few things going on here. Uh, we need. Um, situational awareness. We, we can use tools to help us understand a lot faster when it is safe to go in. Uh, and you can see that uh, at, in that part of the neighborhood there's one structure burning, and you can also see something else. There's nobody else around. Because the system is not designed to respond on a fashion necessary to meet the buoy problem. When we're integrating resources into ICS and we're looking at this as a wildland problem, that, as a wildland fire that works over days, in some cases weeks, the course of a few minutes is irrelevant. When you go to an instant commander and talk about a wildland fire and you say half an hour, it doesn't make any critical difference. Here it makes all the difference in the world. So we need to change how we're thinking about this. Uh, the time scales are completely off. That's what we're seeing. And this is exasperated by the fact that because this problem is so new, we don't have the ability to effectively plan our response. And that's where we need to invest. We need to start planning. Um, I cannot see all of you in the audience, but I'd venture a guess that a large fraction of you um, work in cities and towns where you have big, big box stores. Uh, I'm sure that none of you would uh, contemplate responding to a big box store fire without a plan. It's the same thing we have here. It's just much, much larger. So we need a really good plan. We need to start developing SOPs, thinking this through, and that's one of the recommendations uh, that we're going to make. In the interest of time, because we only have five minutes, I'm going to um, zoom ahead here. This gives you the, a sense of the resolution of our data, how many rigs were in the community as a function of time. And what we really want is we want to take the shape of that curve and push it to the left. Get people in there when safe, as safe as possible, as fast as possible. That's the game changer. Now, uh, I mentioned Peregrine early on, and that's what I want to close with, to show you uh, an extreme scenario. Um, 
The big yellow line is uh, the assault of the uh, fire, the wild fire to the Mountain Shadows community. The small little yellow line up on top of the screen in the peregrine box is, is what happened up there. There was a big flare up, um, about a quarter or half acre uh, fire at the top of the hill blew up, catabatic winds from an afternoon thunderstorm came rushing down the community. But what was different here is the resources had been pre-deployed. So we had a lot of boots on the ground, a lot of engines. They had done a lot of structure prep work. This thing hit, and you'll see how severe it was. Even though it was contained, we're estimating flame lengths 100 to 130 feet. Nobody got hurt, and only two structures suffered minor damage because they were prepared. So these are four snapshots for a video we got. Uh, you can see the activity, and you can see how quickly, within 40 seconds, uh, the whole thing had the potential to really go south. Um, some of the mutual aid, not familiar with WUI tactics, was actually hooked to a hydrant. Uh, luckily, they uh, took shelter behind the structure, and uh, everybody was uh, saved. The others who could evacuate, evacuated for literally two and a half to three minutes, went back, re-engaged, every structure was successfully saved. This is a great lesson learned, a success story that very few people actually know about the Waldo fire. <coughs> Pardon me. So, uh, situational awareness. I just want to mention that uh, when we do this type of uh, reconstruction, we had to go all the way, track every responder down. In the majestic area where most of the structures were destroyed, there are just two points I want to make. The upper yellow um, arrow indicates an area where a structure was undamaged. It took us 151 technical discussions to find out who saved that home. For the first 150, it was, it was either I do not know or it was a miracle home. At discussion 151, Forest Service, Northern California, they were there the whole night, saved that home. Uh, so this is how we debunk the myths. And this is how we identify the effectiveness, really the amazing success stories of the defensive actions. The lower part of that area successfully saved the team. The task force moved on. The task force leader for the next task force came in completely unaware that that entire part of the community had been successfully defended. A big lesson learned that could affect tactics in the future. Again, all this after action uh, can add tremendous value. So with just a couple of minutes left, I'm going to uh, fly through these, if you don't mind. Uh, observations are very limited in space and time. So uh, you really need to understand the entire um, continuum. Just as an example, uh, 1605 Manning Way was a structure that was ignited, suppressed, and reignited probably half a dozen times uh, throughout the first 12 hours. Uh, in many cases, we had first responders driving by saying that house was not on fire. Well, that house had been on fire. So understanding the whole event is absolutely important. Uh, PPE, this is the only thing I'm going to uh, mention on this slide. Uh, smoke inhalation in the WUI can be a significant problem, and uh, uh, Laurie Moore, I know, is working um, on that issue uh, because of the potential problems associated with the effluent from all the burning uh, plastics in the structures. Uh, utilities, uh, the utilities in this case, um, for the most part, they weren't an issue. Power lines were underneath. Where there were some lines that were downed. Uh, task force leader called to have the power shut off. He was told, we can shut off the power, but you won't have any water because it was all interlinked. Uh, so things to consider. Uh, communication, uh, minor point but important, um, mutual aid, uh, Colorado Springs, uh, they did a very nice job of putting in first responders from the city on mutual aid rigs so that there would be uh, better awareness of what's going on. Um, no way to charge the, um, the handheld radios on, on mutual aid rigs, ended up with communication problems. Uh, one last thing I want to point out here Again, why these are just examples of why we need to look at this differently. Uh, this is a case where we have uh, video documentation of a defensive action causing 
or enhancing the potential of structure ignitions downwind. In a building fire, uh, there is an explicit uh, mindset of putting water on the fire. Here, that's not always necessarily the best approach. Uh, what we saw here is when the homes are uh, opened up and they're coming apart, direct hose stream can actually enhance the generation of embers. And in this case, embers traveled 330 feet and caught another roof on fire downwind, uh, which was successfully uh, extinguished and the, the structure was saved. So cross-training of the wood fundamentals are very important. So I have a number of uh, mitigation uh, recommendations here that I'm going to go uh, through very, very briefly. So we want to identify the hazards in the community. That's very, very important. Identify them geospatially. Know what is combustible and where. That's, that's step number one. Don't worry about rating systems. Don't worry about weights. Just figure out what is where. That's very, very important. If possible, remove the fuel. Don't displace it. Don't take your firewood and put it next to your neighbor's house. Right? Very important. Uh, we want an entire framework of SOPs, tactics, for responding to the WUI safely and in a timely fashion. And that's a paradigm shift, because right now our tools are either building or wildland. This WUI is falling between the cracks. Documenting fire behavior. The video that I showed you was absolutely instrumental, along with thousands of other pictures and um, hundreds of other videos that, that we had. Uh, what we're seeing is that they are essential to capturing how safely the first responders deployed, what actions they took, what actions they didn't take, um, from evaluating the entire incident from an after action perspective. What is missing are guidelines for how to take those pictures, how to store those pictures, uh, all those issues associated, and that's very, very important. Uh, the same way law enforcement is, is documenting their actions, I think that is an opportunity, really, to capture what is going on out in the field. Uh, the uh, post-fire documentation, my recommendation is really just focus on damage. Uh, I hope I have conveyed to you that doing this type of uh, uh, reconstruction is extremely um, expensive and uh, takes a lot of time and beyond the scope of most um, uh, agencies. Damage is very important. If we can get good damage information, that can really help us. Uh, so in summary, uh, the fire problem is changing. I'm not saying that the uh, uh, building fires are no longer there, but we have a lot of history on how to deal with building fires. WUI is a completely uh, different uh, type of challenge. The Wilder Fire investigation demonstrated that defensive actions are essential in understanding uh, what you see after the fact. And lastly, we need new tools. We need new tools to respond safely and rapidly to these types of disasters. With that, I want to thank you for your